Hey everybody, this is the final lecture of our very short semester here. Um, today I'm going to talk about the very complicated, long winding um, history of emancipation, um, which is of course the, the process by which enslaved people became free people um, during and after the American Civil War. Um, emancipation is the most important event in American history um, that no one talks about. It's in many ways the sort of defining event of modern American history. It creates the legal foundation um, of our society in many ways that we take for granted or, or really aren't aware of. Um, as I'll explain a little later in this lecture, it, it's considered by most historians to be the second founding of the United States, right? When we think about the American Revolution and the founding fathers, um, we tend to think uh, that the country was simply created, rolled out, and it's just been going ever since. But many historians would argue that the country was reborn again after the, uh, the death of slavery. Um, culturally reborn, politically reborn, certainly economically reborn. Um, and so we're going to get into some of the processes that defined this very complicated thing, um, this very complicated time. Um, earlier this summer, a lot of Americans were, for the first time in my life that I can remember, talking about emancipation in a very public way. This was on June 19th when people were talking about Juneteenth, which is sort of the holiday that commemorates emancipation. And it was surprising to me as I reflected on the fact that so few people had actually in my life ever um, discussed emancipation outside of uh, the world of history that I live and work in. Um, so hopefully you all can take some some helpful information away from this to, to get a better sense of the origins of actually your country. Um, American history as told popularly is is generally defined by wars and great heroic moments. Um, and there's a big gap generally in our in our knowledge that goes from about the end of the Civil War, which has a very hard end date as popularly imagined in 1865 up to um, World War II, right? There's this huge gap in the middle that I think a lot of people really don't know much about. And it's a confusing period and it doesn't fit many of the kind of cliches we have about the rest of the history of the country. Um, so hopefully this will give you a little bit more of a background in some of these topics. Sorry to meander a little bit here at the beginning. I'm gonna leave this uh, the quiz for this lecture open for an extra day I know you all have been working on your papers, so you'll have through Tuesday um, to take that quiz. This lecture will probably be a little bit long just because I want to cram kind of a lot of information into this one. Um, so if you need to take your time with this one and, and maybe watch it in two chunks or, or just find a time where you have a little extra, a few extra minutes to watch it, um, you have an extra day. Okay. Um, so let's get into it. So needless to say, emancipation was uh, the most significant outcome, obviously, of the American Civil War. Um, as I said a moment ago, it's really one of the most significant events uh, in the history of the United States, perhaps the most significant. Um, but despite its significance, it's actually a really hard thing to pin down and track as it developed during the war. It's not clean. I think sometimes we imagine um, and school children for decades were taught, you know, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. He, as if it was by the stroke of a pen, it was just over. It's really, really messy. Um, it looks different from one town to another town, county to county, state to state. Um, and unlike most turning points, which are concentrated on sort of like a single event, Emancipation is just too long and too messy to really pin down to any one place at any one time. You could, all of you could make an argument, a convincing argument now, because you have so many primary sources, um, that since slavery began in America, emancipation had been happening, right? Because every one of the enslaved people who escaped, whose advertisements you found this semester, emancipated themselves. Right, you could say the age of emancipation was a centuries long process, um, but obviously it's most concentrated in the United States in uh, the 1860s. Once the war broke out, enslaved people began fleeing slavery immediately. 
right? As you see in your advertisements, enslaved people were always working for any moment where the power structure around them was distracted or it broke down to free themselves, right? And so the beginning of the war was a clear moment and we see this in Virginia, which is where the war was concentrated in the early year uh, or in, in the first year. Um, as early as May of 1861, right after the war began, we see enslaved people fleeing to Union fortresses. Um, but in fact, throughout the first year of the war, uh, the official policy of the Union of the United States was called denial of asylum. Um, and that meant that any slave escaping to the Union um, or into Union lines had to be returned as long as the owner, the enslaver, was loyal to the Union. Right, so this is obviously a political move. Union leaders were concerned about seeming like they were an anti-slavery or abolitionist party. They wanted to make sure, they want to sell the war to Northerners as a preserving the Union effort, not as an effort to free slaves, at least at first. That changes and I'll get to that. Um, there, there's a few practical problems with denial of asylum. There's obviously a moral problem with it, right? Returning enslaved people to enslavers is not popular among abolitionists and among many soldiers. Um, but there's a practical problem, which is that uh, for one, there's thousands and thousands of enslaved people heading towards these camps, towards Union Army camps. And it's very, very difficult and requires a ton of time um, for commanders to deal with each one of these people on an individual case by case basis. It's also impossible to trace their ownership because enslaved people aren't going to say where they came from, truthfully, right? They're going to hide that information to the best of their ability so that they can't be uh, returned. Um, or they'll say that their own, they, they'll make a very easy move and say that their owners were loyal to the Confederacy and not to the Union and then they wouldn't have to be returned. So it's a, the policy is a flop. Um, and so the initial outcome is that Union forces simply don't even try to return uh, enslaved people. And instead, um, following the example of a general from Massachusetts named Benjamin Butler, um, they begin simply keeping enslaved people in camps um, and calling them contraband of war, right? So this is one means of emancip emancipating people from their enslavement is saying, well, if slaveholders call these people property and this is a war against slaveholders, then we have every right to declare this property contraband of war and we're going to claim it, right? Um, and this obviously is very frustrating uh, and enraging to enslavers, but it makes sense uh, rationally that in war you would you would do this. Um, all this is happening, and this is all in about 1861 and early 1862. And if you don't have a clear timeline of the Civil War, it begins in the spring of 1861 and ends in the spring of 1865. So it's about four years long. So very early on, um, these are the debates on the ground. Emancipation isn't being decided in the White House. It's not being decided in the Capitol building. It's being decided on the ground in hundreds of little camps all through Virginia and Missouri and all of these places along the North-South border. Um, Congress takes the initiative, however, beginning in 1862 to start figuring out a more coherent policy to deal with this crisis. And it is, it's essentially a refugee crisis, right? Um, freed people are refugees from slavery and they're trying to find their way to freedom. Um, in March of 62, Congress overturns denial of asylum um, and declares that if um, an enslaved person frees themselves and gets to union lines, they're simply free. Um, in April, of 1862, Congress abolishes slavery in Washington, D.C. This is interesting case though, this is compensated slave uh, emancipation, meaning the federal government actually paid enslavers um, for their enslaved property. Okay, so they pay $300 per person in compensation to owners. Um, there were 3,100 enslaved people in Washington at the time, so it's about $93,000 to slaveholders to end slavery. Again, the politics of the North are not stridently abolitionists, so they have to be careful and they have to try to um, 
maintain as much support as possible so that slaveholders in Washington DC don't turn all of their support towards the Confederacy. Many slaveholders remained loyal to the Union um, and that was always a factor in determining emancipation policy. Um, in June um, of 1862, Congress abolished slavery forever in the Western territories where there were very few enslaved people. So this is somewhat symbolic, but um, it, it really addresses one of the major causes of the war, which is to what extent will there be slavery in the West? In July of 1862, and I know I'm just sort of running through these laws here, but you can see this is constantly on the minds of lawmakers and they're just churning out responses. Um, July of 1862, we have what's called the Second Confiscation Act. Um, this is sort of a precursor to the Emancipation Proclamation. What it said was any person who is supporting the Confederacy and owns slaves, those slaves are now freed. Um, and those people, it doesn't matter where those people live, right? So if you are a slaveholder and you live in Kentucky, which was a union state, and a slave state, it's kind of complicated, um, your enslaved property is now free. Okay, um, so this that was a somewhat radical piece of legislation because it challenged slaveholders even in states that were loyal to the Union. Um, so what we're seeing in 1862 um, is Congress with the backing of the president, with the backing of Abraham Lincoln, um, taking steps towards emancipation and toward making abolition uh, of slavery a war aim. Um, this is a picture of a man. This man was declared contraband of war. Um, this, this man was uh, born obviously in slavery um, and escaped into a union camp in Washington, DC. This picture was taken at some point during the war. It's unclear exactly when it was, as I said, it was taken in Washington, DC. Pictures like this are, are deeply moving to me and I, I imagine to many of you as well, right? This is the face, this, we, we begin to have photographic evidence of, of people who were born into these conditions and had the resilience and the tenacity and the, and the drive to, to will themselves to freedom under the most grueling conditions, you know, or under incredibly grueling conditions as same with these men here, all of these men were declared contraband of war. Um, and then many likely became soldiers in the Union Army um, as the war developed. And I'll talk more about that in a second. There's tons of these pictures online. If you just search for emancipation or if you search contraband of war, you can see dozens um, of images of these people. Okay. Um, let's talk about the Emancipation Proclamation for a minute, which I think is sort of a, is such a complex document and can be, I think, befuddling a little bit to all of us because it's not clearly any one thing. Um, it, it doesn't quite live up to our expectations of what a great document should be. And yet it's enormously significant um, and in many ways enormously effective. So the Emancipation Proclamation declared, and you read this last week, all persons held as slaves within any state or part of a state, uh, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States shall be forever free. In other words, if you are an enslaved person and the place where you live is rebelling against the United States, you shall be free. Okay, and you read the list of states and parts of states uh, that this applied to. And it commits the federal government, including the military and naval authority thereof, um, to ensuring emancipation. Not only are you declared free, but it is the strategic goal of the United States military um, to end your enslavement. Okay, now as you know, as you read this, you probably realized, and as our discussions developed, surely you realized that this was a very limited document. Um, it didn't technically free anybody, right? The stroke of this pen, it wasn't like chains were undone and people just walked away. That's not quite how it worked. Um, and it didn't even free as many people as the Second Confiscation Act because it didn't apply to any union loyal states or parts of states. Um, it only applies again to those rebellious states. But here's the thing, and, and this is something that Lincoln absolutely understood well. 
it's something that soldiers, Union soldiers who were stationed in the Southern United States understood well, and it's something that enslaved people definitely understood well. Very few people cared about the details of this document. Okay, Lincoln's critics in the North weren't about to look at all the details and let him off the hook, right? Pro-slavery critics in the North. Confederates certainly weren't going to let him off the hook. Um, and enslaved people were not going to look at all of the little details of this and say like, does this apply to me? Does this not apply to me? It's not really the way it was going to work once news of this got out. Um, instead, what people, what mattered to people was the sort of symbolic value of this document. The United States government had at this point committed itself to ending slavery. Um, and every step the US military took henceforth would be to liberate enslaved people. And in response to this, enslaved people intensify the process of emancipating themselves. As you can see in this picture in the background, this is a good capture, captures this quite well, right? People begin to walk away en masse. They begin to escape en masse. Um, many white Southerners did not hear about the Emancipation Proclamation until their enslaved property began to walk away, began to leave, um, which uh, reminds us of the very powerful, very effective communication networks that African Americans had even in slavery, which you all have been seeing, I'm sure, in your ads, right? You see um, how an enslaver has a sense that someone maybe went to go to their wife or they have friends in this neighborhood or they may have gone here, right? There was this subculture that existed that allowed enslaved people to let one another know that this was the policy and that they should get moving and they and they did right so the proclamation is a sort of encouraging moment and then enslaved people are the ones who really do the work of emancipation going forward um there's other symbolic power here too right the emancipation proclamation committed the u.s government um in the eyes of the world to ending slavery um there's there's some sort of geopolitical stakes here, right? If the British, the British were always sort of lurking on the side of the American Civil War and very close at some points to siding with the South, the Confederacy. Um, but if they were to do this after the proclamation, it would be a signal that they were a slave supporting government um, or a slavery supporting government, which is a political risk because Britain had a very staunch and large abolitionist block um, and a long heritage of abolitionist work. So that wasn't going to really be politically feasible. Um, another thing it does, the Emancipation Proclamation um, authorizes a formal process by which uh, black men could become soldiers in the United States uh, Army. Um, and this is something that formerly enslaved people want very, very badly, as well as free blacks in the North want very, very badly. Um, it's very important to them that they can have the ability to, to destroy slavery by fighting against it. Um, by the end of the war, about 10% of total union forces were black men. Um, that's uh, about 180,000 people. 80% of those uh, had been former slaves, which is a stunning, a stunning thing to think about, just how many people that is, I don't know what 80% of 180,000 is, but um, it's about 8% of the entire army. Um, so not only is this an army dedicated to ending slavery, it's an army, at least partially, of formerly enslaved people dedicated to ending slavery. Um, and the proclamation really is, is what um, brings that reality uh, into focus. So finally, crucially, um, emancipation transformed the purpose of the American Civil War, which many of us would recognize quite instantly was the ending of slavery, was abolition. Um, but that was not the case prior to the proclamation. This war was very stridently and staunchly about, at least from the Northern perspective, preserving the Union. That was the, that was the only stated purpose of this war. Um, but after the proclamation, you now have a dual purpose, preserve the union, and it's a better union because it will be one without slavery. 
Um, so this is now, after this point, uh, unquestionably a war on the South's fundamental social and economic institutions, and the war can now only end in unconditional surrender with the destruction of slavery. So the stakes are much higher at this point. One quick thing before I move on to, you'll see on the slide here, that first bullet point, preliminary September, official January. Um, this was just sort of a political tactic on Lincoln's part. He issued a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862. He had had a major, well, his soldiers had had a major bat, uh, victory at the Battle of Antietam in that month. And so with the kind of political capital that came from that victory, um, he issues this document and he says, if the Confederacy doesn't surrender, then on January 1st, I'm going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. They didn't surrender. So on January 1st, he issued the document that we know. Um, so the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation is sort of like a, a shot across the bow. It's a warning to the South. It's also a warning to Northerners that this is going to become a war aim um, if they don't surrender. Um, and it's a way of sort of blaming them for it becoming a war aim as well. That's kind of complicated political stuff. Um, uh, spoiler alert, the war uh, ends in 1865 and the Union is victorious. I'm not going to talk really at all here about the military side of that, that story. Um, that's the most written about episode in American history, so plenty of sources for you to dig into if you're interested in that. The immediate outcome of the war um, is the end of slavery, which is sort of made official with an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution is changed. This is the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. It's ratified in December of 1865. If you want to know the kind of insider politics side of this story, you could see the movie Lincoln, which is fine, a fine movie. Um, and it tells the story of, of uh, the passage of the 13th Amendment in Congress before it went to the states for ratification. Um, from our perspective, the 13th Amendment seems like an obvious outcome of the Civil War, right? What would the Civil War be in our minds if it, if it had not ended with a guarantee of the end of slavery? But it was not, um, it was never guaranteed, right? In fact, it was sort of remarkable that it passed at all. Um, Lincoln had begun really focusing on it uh, after his reelection in November of 1864 because he was very afraid that the war would end soon. He knew the war was going to end by that point. Um, and then the Emancipation Proclamation might be declared by the Supreme Court unconstitutional, right? He's worried that every effort he's made to end slavery actually could be rolled back um, and that no progress would actually be made in the project of emancipation. The entire war could have been fought um, and the slave power could still exist. You need something stronger. You need a constitutional guarantee. Um, so um, the 13th Amendment is essential. Slavery likely would have returned in some form without it. Um, it would also end slavery in the border states, which were not touched by the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, it passes the House of Representatives by only two votes in January of 1865, two votes. That's the difference between the continuation of slavery after the Civil War um, and its death. Two votes. It's, it's um, definitely not a guarantee that it would work out that way. We tend to think, well, things work out for the best in history over time because people are essentially good. And that's just not the case, right? This barely, barely happened. Um, you could say it's almost by chance that it happened. Um, the 13th Amendment states that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment of crime or for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, we'll talk about that in a second, um, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. There will not be slavery in the United States, except in cases where someone's convicted of a crime and enslavement is part of their punishment. There is a film on, I believe, Netflix. Um, it's on some streaming service called 13th, 
um, that explores this problem, right? That explores that, that little clause, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. Um, and explores how mass incarceration has developed in the modern United States and how enslavement is sort of part of the mass incarceration system. I strongly recommend you watch that film um, because it really complicates the story of emancipation. Um, but for now, I just want to focus on 1865. This is a simply worded document. It's, it's a very short amendment to the Constitution. Um, some are very long. But its simplicity contributes to, I think, some of the ambivalence that surrounds the 13th Amendment. We all have an image of what slavery was or Southern slavery was in our heads, although hopefully all of you have a slightly more complicated image of that now. Um, it's the sort of thing you think, like, you know it when you see it, right? But involuntary servitude which is what this bans is actually really complicated, right? And that could mean a lot more than plantation slavery. So it's not exactly clear what, what the significance of this is broadly. And we have in the decade after the 13th Amendment was ratified, um, thousands and thousands of women who say that being a wife is a form of involuntary servitude in the 19th century, that a wife lost her personhood within marriage um, and that uh, there was a relationship between a woman's role in a marriage and uh, an enslaved person's role under their enslaver. Um, I could talk to you more about sources if you're interested in that debate that develops immediately after this. Um, the other side of the 13th Amendment is that it does not provide a roadmap for what should come next. It merely eliminates one form of labor relationships, but it doesn't necessarily say what definitely needs to follow. Um, I think many Northerners sort of took for granted that wage labor would come next, right? That enslaved people might, formerly enslaved people would go back to many of the same roles they had filled before, but now they'd get paid to do it. They would sign a contract and they'd get money for it. Um, that wasn't gonna be possible for the most part. The South's economy had been completely destroyed by the Civil War. It lacked the infrastructure to support a complex wage labor economy. Um, there's also racist attitudes toward freed people that assume they don't understand their freedom and emancipation is pointless. Um, there's one South Carolinian who says that um, freed people did not understand the liberty which had been conferred upon them. Right? Freedom is too complicated for them. They'll never understand it. Um, this is obviously wrong. And if we really want to understand what came after slavery, um, if we want to understand how people began to define whatever would come into that void, what freedom would actually look like, we shouldn't really look to northern political economists who are talking about wage labor, and we definitely shouldn't look to former slaveholders. We should look at what freed people themselves actually did, because it was their actions that began to define what this absence of slavery would look like. In other words, what freedom is going to be. Okay, so let's shift gears for a second here. Um, so what did freed people do? What did they do with themselves as slavery collapsed beneath them or as they destroyed slavery by um, upending it? Um, first thing they did, and this is super important, is they just moved around a lot. Um, in 1865, huge portions of the South's black population took to the roads. They just got moving, right? And this makes sense. When you think about the ads you've been reading all semester and you read about so-and-so has relations in this neighborhood or so-and-so has a wife in this place or so-and-so has children here enslaved people's closest relationships were scattered from Virginia to Texas, right? Or from one city to another city, from one county to another county, and they had to go find each other. Um, as one former slave in Texas recalled about this movement, he wrote, they, freed people, seemed to want to get closer to freedom so they'd know what it was, like it was a place or a city they hit the road to go in search of it 
as if it was a concrete destination. And I think for many people, it actually was. And that concrete destination was where their loved ones were, right? The places that they could call home. Um, it was also important to get moving to, to go in search of opportunity, right? There's not just this sort of sentimental pull. There's the pull of survival. Um, again, the landscape of the South is demolished by the war. Um, crops haven't been planted in several years, at least not consistently. There's not a lot of food. There's not a lot of infrastructure. Um, so people move into cities where there's better chance. They move towards, again, US military camps, which are installed all across the South throughout this reconstruction period and are some kind of a source of stability and protection. Um, and some people travel for the sake of traveling because um, to move without papers or to move without the direction of a slaveholder was an impossibility, right? It was the ultimate example, the ultimate symbol of freedom throughout uh, slavery. And so to not be able, or to not have to do that, to not have to have that kind of permission is a way of like performing your freedom. What else do they do? As I said a minute ago, they reunited families, right? Uh, one of these kind of classic badges of slavery, right? Like um, burdens of slavery was that enslavers had power to break up families. And so an exercise of freedom is to rebuild your family. Um, once rebuilt, they established new family norms. Um, the 19th century was a time um, that some historians have called the sort of cult of domesticity. Um, what that means is there's an ideal, right, that we might call a nuclear family ideal, where men support the family with wages or with food or however they do it. Um, they support the family economically while women stay home and tend to the home um, and raise the children and sort of direct the moral sphere of life. We see the cult of domesticity in this picture on the left. Um, enslaved people did not have the opportunity to perform this. They did not have the opportunity to enjoy a family structure in this way. Women labored alongside men in the fields. Um, this goes back to the 17th century documents we read in the first or second week of class that barred white women from working in the fields, but allowed um, black women or forced black women to work in the fields, right? As a way of dividing uh, womanhood, a way of dividing that gender identity by black and white. So there's an opportunity here for black women to uh, return to the domestic sphere and live up to this very common 19th century ideal. Um, other things they did, another ideal of the 19th century, they sent children to school. Between 1865 and 1870, the freed population expended more than $1 million. These are formerly enslaved people who have very little money. They expended more than $1 million total on education. They established churches. They pooled their resources to buy land to construct buildings so that they could meet publicly for the first time in their lives. They entered politics. Um, they organized at the local level, uh, petitioning federal and state officials. Um, they voted like crazy between 70 and 90%, depending on the place of eligible uh, black voters voted during the 1860s and 1870s. They achieved high political office. A um, man named PBS Pinchback, born into slavery, became the governor of Louisiana. Um, he was only governor for a month, but he did become the governor of Louisiana. Blacks held political office in most southern states, um, including very high offices. 16 former slaves um, were elected to the United States Congress. Two of them were senators. Um, these numbers weren't proportional, obviously, to the size of the black population. That would have required far more people to enter government, but the distinction from slavery at the beginning of the decade to Congress at the end of the decade is almost uh, mind boggling. It's hard to imagine that this happened. This picture on the left, this, these are members of the Constitutional Convention of the State of Louisiana in 1868. As you can tell, 
Most of these men very likely were born into slavery. By the end of the decade, they were rewriting their state's constitution. Um, okay. In other words, what does all this mean? Early in this period of Reconstruction, the five years or so after the end of the Civil War, from about 1865 up to 1870, roughly, freedom came to mean not only escaping the injustices of slavery, right, escaping whippings, escaping family separation, escaping the denial of literacy and education, escaping sexual exploitation, um, but it also comes to mean something positive, right? It's not a negative, just avoiding things that were horrible, but also an achievement of things that are very powerful and very important. Um, it's a sort of collective empowerment that uh, free people demand and achieve. Um, that is a share in the rights and the entitlements um, of American citizenship, the rights to um, religious worship, the right uh, to form a family, to choose one's labor, to travel, to govern oneself and one's um, uh, and with uh, one's neighbors. So this is the sort of beautiful um, and deeply moving side of the story of Reconstruction. It's very obvious, I think, to all of us that there would be a retribution to this, and there obviously was. Um, Many um, former Confederates, right, these are Southern whites, had little intention of recognizing the 13th Amendment. Um, while Congress, many Northerners, um, just common Northerners as well as elites who are serving in Congress, celebrated the legal end of slavery. Um, there were still horrific, very violent reprisals against Black people throughout the South. It was an extremely dangerous time. Right, which I just want to go back to this slide for a second. All of these things I just described were done amidst enormous pressure and threat. Um, and many people were killed for trying to enjoy these freedoms. I'm going to talk about that here. Um, uh, initially, there is widespread adoption of what were called black codes. And these were special laws in Southern states. You see black codes in South Carolina and Mississippi and Louisiana, et cetera, that ban uh, African-Americans from moving without a pass, from congregating, um, ban them from negotiating their contracts. So there are technically contracts, but the subject of the contract has no choice in the matter and is forced to sign it. In other words, black codes were an attempt to recreate slavery immediately. Um, and they were undone by the 13th Amendment as well as the subsequent Civil Rights Act that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and they were also undone by the installation, the permanent, at least semi-permanent installation of Northern troops throughout the South to make sure that states weren't passing these laws, um, to block them from passing these laws or trying to enforce these laws. Um, but for that first year, uh, 1865, this is very common, and it seems like slavery will be, will return. In addition to state organized oppression, like the Black Codes, we see terrorism throughout this decade. Um, in Shreveport, Louisiana, um, belligerent former Confederate soldiers coming home from the war murdered approximately 2,000 African Americans in 1865. So that's a mass murder of almost unprecedented scale in the history of the United States um, in Shreveport, Louisiana. In Pine Bluffs, Arkansas, in early 1866, a few months after the Shreveport uh, massacres, the local white community burned a black settlement um, and uh, a visitor to the scene the next day, an observer uh, described encountering, and this is quite horrific, apologize for this, 24 bodies, 24 bodies of men, women, and children um, hanging in the trees surrounding Pine Bluffs. Um, smaller incidents, by smaller I mean in terms of numbers like that, were fairly commonplace throughout much of the South at this time. Um, in 1866 in Memphis, Tennessee, a collision between two horse-drawn carriages, right, just an everyday sort of accident. Um, 
sparked a three-day massacre in which 46 people uh, were killed. The majority of them were freed people. Um, thousands of black homes and churches and schools were burned. That was also in 1866. You have an image of that here uh, on the left. Um, and then later that same year, black supporters of Louisiana's governor, uh, who was a reconstruction friendly governor, a Republican, and had proposed banning rebels, former rebels from voting, uh, were murdered in New Orleans. Uh, 34 of them were murdered, several hundred more were injured. Uh, as one union officer put it, the wholesale slaughter that he saw in New Orleans in 1866 rivaled what he'd seen on the battlefields of the war. So this is the sort of nightmare of reconstruction, um, of racist violence uh, that consumes many parts of the South throughout this period. This isn't necessarily everywhere. Um, although there are incidents of violence everywhere, violence on this scale seems fairly well concentrated in the lower Mississippi Valley. Um, and I, I've not seen someone do a study of this. I'm sure someone has. I haven't, I haven't read that though. And I don't really understand why the patterns of violence were where they were um, or why it was more intense in some places than others. Um, although I could, I suppose, offer a few ideas uh, about why that would be. But the bigger point is that this kind of violence was relatively common um, and that all freed people lived in fear of retribution of one kind or another, right? This is the end of slavery doesn't bring a utopia, obviously, of, um, of black freedom. So what does the federal government do in response? Uh, there are a few things. The first is the federal government created what was called the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, this was a social welfare agency. It was the first um, uh, dedicated to aiding displaced people. It wasn't only dedicated to serving freed people. It was uh, also dedicated to um, aiding any refugee after the war uh, find some form of settlement. Many refugees were also white people, but it becomes known as the Freedmen's Bureau because its main task is really helping freed people make the transition away from slavery. Um, it provides food, it provides medicine, education to black and white refugees in the South, and it helps um, formerly enslaved people negotiate contracts. It weighs in on disputes between employers and employees, all of these sorts of things that arise um, after slavery. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 uh, passed by a very radical Republican Congress. Um, and when I say radical Republicans, what I mean is they had um, what was considered a radical vision of race relations in the United States, which would call for real black equality. Um, and they were in control uh, throughout this period. Um, they define citizenship um, for the first time in the history of the United States. The US government had never really defined what it meant to be a citizen of the United States until this point, um, which meant that they were saying that People born in the United States have rights that are guaranteed by the national government, not by their states. And prior to this point, most Americans identified their political rights with their state, right? It was a much more local form of understanding your citizenship. Um, and this is saying, no, if you're, the, the people of the United States share a common nation and share common rights and privileges, okay? Um, and it says that citizenship can't be limited by race or gender. Okay, so this is super progressive legislation um, that follows the war. Um, it is then followed by the 14th Amendment, which expands on much of what's in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And just like that 13th Amendment, it turns it into guarantees that can't be overturned by the courts, right? The 14th Amendment has five parts. I do not expect you to memorize all of them, in part because some of them are are sort of um, very specific to the moment and not as significant for us today at all. Um, but let me run through them quickly. The first um, is the one that radically, the first part of it is the one that radically transforms the relationship between American citizens um, and their government. 
radically transformed the federal government's role in American life and ensured the revolutionary nature of Reconstruction. And that was that the 14th Amendment guarantees the equal protection of the law to all American citizens. Okay. Um, when most Americans think of what's in the Bill of Rights, what they actually are talking about is what's in the 14th Amendment, which is not in the Bill of Rights. Okay, it was added later, obviously, almost a century later. Um, the 14th Amendment uh, declares that any person born in the United States is a citizen of the United States, which was the only way to ensure that people who were born into slavery could become citizens of this country. Um, it does some other things as well. It repudiates the Confederate debt. It says, yeah, they accrued a bunch of debt trying to fight us in this war, but we're not paying it. Um, any other things that I could quickly mention here? Mm, nothing that's significant for our debate. The, the crucial, or for our discussion, the crucial takeaway here is birthright citizenship and then equal protection of the laws for all citizens, regardless of race or sex. Okay. The 14th Amendment um, is the basis of the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Um, it is the basis for essentially every major political struggle in modern American life, uh, including those that we're experiencing in our country right now. Um, as one historian has claimed, about two thirds of court cases in American law since 1866, well, 68, have dealt with rights granted by this amendment. It is sort of the centerpiece of American law uh, in many ways, okay? Um, and it is the, the cornerstone of reconstruction policy. What the radical Republicans who wrote these laws and amendments claimed um, was that they were nationalizing the Bill of Rights, right? They were saying that what's in the Constitution, especially in the Bill of Rights, would now apply equally to all citizens and it would determine the scope of American liberty everywhere, at least theoretically, right? Because someone has to enforce it and the federal government hasn't always enforced it. Um, okay. There's the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. I don't wanna to go too deeply into these. They're basically how the federal government organized the South to carry out the plan of reconstruction. Um, but the most important thing to know is what the federal government said was if Southern states want to rejoin the United States, they have to ratify the 14th Amendment. That's a condition of their re-entry. So they did, and that's how it becomes law. Um, the 15th Amendment, follows a few years later. Um, the 14th Amendment had left it up to states to protect the right to vote, um, which was a mistake because states were unreliable in this regard and, and sometimes remain unreliable in this regard. Um, the 15th Amendment then guarantees black men the right to vote and says that that's not up to states to decide that anymore. Um, it's passed um, in 1869, right before Ulysses S. Grant is, uh, takes the oath of office and becomes the president. Um, okay, that's a super fast rundown of Reconstruction law. Um, but as you can see, I mean, if you think about the sum total of everything I just described, we're seeing a, a radical revision of American public life. And so much of what we talked about in this class is being addressed for the first time in, in really serious ways. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of years of tradition and economics and politics. And we have these legislators who are very quickly attempting to undo all of that. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing moment and it truly is a second founding. It makes sense that people would call that. It's completely revising what it means to be an American. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily last at least not the effort to make these changes happen, right? The 14th Amendment is still the law. Its legacy is ongoing, um, but the political momentum of this era begins to peter out into the early 1870s. And I'll move kind of quickly here because I don't want to keep you all too long. Um, second founding, yeah, okay. Radical moment begins to fizzle out. My notes are, are a little messy here in this section. Um, 
racial violence continues in the South. It doesn't necessarily go anywhere. I talked about all of these forms of terrorism back here. Um, the Ku Klux Klan, by the way, I didn't, I didn't get into, but the Ku Klux Klan develops in 1865 and becomes widespread, very popular. During the late 1860s, the federal government effectively crushes it. There is a law, the Ku Klux Klan Act, passed um, during Ulysses Grant's uh, presidency, and federal troops effectively destroy, and federal um, prosecutors effectively destroy the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but there are other forms of terrorist groups that emerge, um, and it becomes very difficult to maintain northern political will and energy to keep protecting freed people's lives, um, even though they face certain death and disenfranchisement if the North begins to pull away, uh, but it does. Um, let's talk about Southern violence and hatred in this moment for just a second here. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that you could explain why Southern whites resorted to terrorism. Um, in this period. Um, you could talk about ex-Confederates feelings of resentment and listlessness. Historians have done this, right? So guys come back from the war, they're trained in horrific violence, they have nothing waiting for them, um, and they're filled with rage uh, at formerly enslaved people. Um, some people who are perhaps very sympathetic to the South have talked about the grief over the destruction of slavery. They, the grief that they faced over the destruction of a way of life, um, which is not untrue. I mean, I think there's a lot of grief in the South after the American Civil War in the white South. Um, there is um, a political party in the South that's trying to whip up support. They're called the Democrats and they are a white supremacist party in this period. And they exploit racism in order to achieve power. And so they are whipping up racial hatred um, and violence to serve their own ends. Um, there's also the fact that racial hatred was woven into the fabric of Southern life for hundreds of years. Um, and it's just still there. Uh, but most fundamentally, I think, um, the struggle was economic. Uh, whites needed uh, blacks to remain uh, landless and disenfranchised so that they were highly exploitable, um, so that they would be dependent agricultural workers. Um, and that was the primary goal throughout Reconstruction was to make sure that African Americans had as little political power as possible so that they could be economically subjugated. Um, and for their part, formerly enslaved people are are very concerned with their economic rights and attempting to protect them, right? They're think that's what they're doing when they go to school, when they're learning to read or they're learning skills, um, when they're trying to acquire land, like we read in the Adisto Island document, when they're trying to acquire tools, those are all forms of capital that they're trying to acquire so that they can better their economic condition. Um, but there's really no financial capital in the South at this time. Um, what there is, is a sort of bad credit that flows in um, into really ridiculous schemes to build railroads or to build canals. Um, and we just have flop after flop after flop and, and public debts are growing and interest rates and inflation are skyrocketing. Um, and it's sort of a, a disastrous economic situation that I won't go into in great detail here. The big picture is it's not really possible to get a loan, right? So if you're trying to get your life off the ground, like many of you, you go to college to try and move your life into a new direction, right? You take out a loan to do that. You want to buy a home, you take out a loan. You want to start a business, you take out a loan. It's really not possible for most people, white or black, to get a loan in the South after the Civil War. There's no capital. Um, and so freed people are struggling to survive. I'll talk about sharecropping, which is a solution to this problem in just a second. But things get much worse because in 1873, there is a Great Depression that begins, the worst economic calamity in American history before the other Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, the Reconstruction South, which was already struggling, uh, 
basically just collapses into complete economic um, turmoil. Um, and there's, there's nothing there uh, to build a life on, okay? Um, southern governments begin to collapse financially. Um, southern businesses absolutely collapsed to what extent they still existed. Um, and this is especially true throughout the deeper south. Um, in the north, what happens is people's minds begin to, to drift away from the problems of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, and they begin to think about new, new political crises that take center stage. No one, I mean, I, I don't want to say no one, but people who cared greatly about freed people's welfare in 1866, by 1876, they're not really talking about that anymore. Um, they're talking about currency and tariffs and unemployment, and they're talking about subsidies and labor organizing and unions and things like this, um, the price of grain. And so the, um, the African-American, uh, the condition of African-American life uh, loses ground as a political issue and begins to fade away, uh, at least among people who, who could do something about it right? Northerners who have some degree of power. Um, as one very prominent editor and a Republican who had been a great supporter of Reconstruction says in 1870, um, and this is early, this is even before the panic, let us have done with Reconstruction. The country is tired and sick of it. Let us have peace. Let's just move on. Let's forget about it. Let's pull troops out of the South and give up. The consequence of that is what you see in this picture on the left, of course, though, right? If you do that, you are leaving freed people to um, to the vicious uh, outcomes that everyone could predict. So what we see is is that begins to happen during the 1870s. Um, Southern whites begin to come back into power in the South uh, under the Democratic Party. This is an era of counter revolution. Free construction was a revolution. This is a counter revolution. Attempt to push back against it and reconstruct white supremacy. This process is called redemption. Um, so redemption is the counter to reconstruction. Um, its agents call themselves redeemers. Okay, they're all white Democrats. Um, as you know, redemption means the action of saving from sin, right? A redeemer is someone like Jesus Christ who saves and absolves others of their sins. So when historians refer to this process as redemption, like I just did, we're actually accepting a term that was created by these white supremacist Democrats for their actions, right? And that's sort of problematic thing that I think as a field, maybe we should have a conversation about. Um, but that's what we mean when we talk about this moment, all right? But redemption super messy. Um, and this is going to be the last point that I talk about here. And it doesn't play out <clears throat> predictably in all places. Um, and the reason for that is um, that the South wasn't just one place. It was a really diverse place. Um, there was not one way of black and white interacting in the South in this period. In many cases, like I was saying a moment ago with economics, it depends on the economic conditions of a region. It depends on the political history of a region. Um, and so redemption looks different from place to place. Um, one point I wanna keep in mind here is that the idea of white supremacy and black inferiority, those were sort of universal among whites, universal ideas in the South at this time. But that didn't mean that all Southern whites saw an advantage in exploiting that, that idea, right? Some Southern whites would have said, I could push that button if I want to, um, but, but there might be some advantage in building a political alliance with blacks. And many do that. The most famous example of this um, is in Virginia, where there is a black and white political coalition that lasts into the um, 1880s. Um, so we see different experiences from place to place. Um, some states quickly eviscerate black rights, right? As soon as white supremacist Democrats come back to power in Georgia and South Carolina, um, they essentially write black people out of the political community entirely. 
but in North Carolina, in Tennessee, in Texas, in Virginia, uh, Florida, uh, Kentucky, which was a union state, but is a, a slave state, um, black rights are relatively untouched. Black men continue voting en masse all the way through the 1890s in the Jim Crow era. Black men hold positions of public power like sheriff and postmaster in some counties. Um, white political leaders will turn to the black community for support um, in some of these places. So it's, it's, it can be really, really messy. The point here is that what white Democrats wanted was political power. And if that meant aligning themselves for a while with black voters, they would do it. Um, it this sort of a pragmatic story here. That becomes impossible later in the age of Jim Crow and you should take um, African-American history since 1865 to learn more about how Jim Crow worked. But that's not the story immediately after uh, the Civil War and certainly even during uh, redemption. Um, all right. Um, we can see this um, most clearly when we look away from elections, especially national elections. Most of the violence I've described here occurred in election years. Um, elections were bad times in the South because that's when things were most heated. We all know this. We've lived through election years. It's just more intense and more violent back then. Um, and this was especially true when the issue wasn't voting rights and it shifted to like nitty gritty everyday governance stuff that most of us don't think about when we think about government. Um, what sorts of incentives should states offer to railroad companies? Um, how should a state navigate bankruptcy? These kinds of complicated, you could argue boring questions that were really important. That's where you see a lot of white and black alignment. You see, um, racial barriers that you think would be there are simply not there. Um, but you just have to dig really deep into the politics to start seeing that stuff. Um, and, and part of the reason why this is complicated is that whites disagreed, right? There's not white, a single white opinion about how the state of Alabama should navigate its impending bankruptcy. There's actually dozens and dozens of very deeply held perspectives, which means that there's opportunity for black voters and black leaders to enter into those politics um, and assert some degree of authority. Um, at the same time, some very conservative white supremacist figures discouraged violence because um, they feared it would interfere with uh, agricultural productivity. Um, many of these figures made their peace with black political power as long as it didn't interfere with work on the farm or on a plantation. Um, so again, you know, reconstruction racial politics are, are vile and violent and grotesque and also complicated and unexpected um, and strange and don't necessarily fit our, our clear binary of how racial politics we, we might expect would work. So my big point here is just that reconstruction ends up being a few things at once. It's a moment of significant political um, and more moderate but important economic progress for African Americans, right? It's a moment of progress, undoubtedly. Um, it's a moment of advancement. It's a moment of advancing federal power and then a retreat of federal power and an acceptance that Southern states are gonna have their way. It's a moment of terrorism, of racist terrorism. And it's a moment when many white conservatives, including Democrats, accept that slavery is not coming back um, and that some black gains, uh, and, and they accept some black gains in politics and economics in order to achieve stability and begin rebuilding their civilization. So reconstruction is an incredibly messy moment. And I think the new institution of sharecropping captures that complexity. And this is where I'm gonna leave you today. Sharecropping um, was a form of agricultural labor uh, in which um, laborers were effectively tenants, renters, um, and they paid their rent not in cash, because again, there's really no money in the South at this time, but in a share of their crop. Um, and they rent, they paid that rent not only to the person who owned the land, but frequently to, 
a merchant in town who gave them supplies like tools and fertilizer. Um, so it's a system of hundreds of thousands, really millions of overlapping debts um, because there's no, there's no other way to exchange goods in this society. Sharecropping was terrible. It was a, it was a really unproductive solution. Um, tenants hated it because it limited their freedom. Land owners and, well, petty merchants actually liked it a lot because it gave them a lot of power, but landowners generally hated it because it was unpredictable and um, it, it, they lost control to some extent over their land because the um, tenants had some degree of control over what was planted. Um, but it's sort of like the best bad solution to a, a part of this country that had essentially experienced the apocalypse, right? It gives some autonomy um, and a chance to own some of a crop to tenants. Um, it gives landlords a constant source of labor um, and sharecroppers were white and black, right? The, the majority um, of white people, agricultural white people in the South were sharecroppers. Um, this is just, this is how poor people worked and survived in the South at this time. Um, but the majority of formerly enslaved people and their descendants became sharecroppers as well. Um, but it becomes a dead end, right? It has these small benefits, a little bit of autonomy, a little bit of control over labor for the landlord, but it's a dead end because um, blacks never are able to save enough to buy land like they want to or to move on from this place like they want to. Landlords never really get paid because the crops fail a lot because you're monocropping and the soil becomes exhausted. Um, one bad year wipes out everybody's gains and there's so many bad years um, for decades and decades. Um, and these are experienced by, um, by black and white uh, sharecroppers alike. Um, okay, so that's where I'm gonna leave it. Um, again, I think the best move for you to make if you wanna keep learning about this material, if you're still gonna be on campus is to sign up for um, African American history since 1865 or any of, there's a, there's a number of sort of modern African American history classes, 20th century into the 21st century, sign up for one of those. And if you're not gonna do that, I strongly recommend the film 13th to start thinking about how emancipation gets really complicated and we live with those complicated legacies today. Okay, um, thanks for watching everybody and I'm looking forward to talking about emancipation with you.